On December 25, 1952, famous mathematician Lancelot Hogben called upon the scientific community to send radio signals deep into the solar system. Hogben said he had no desire to visit Mars, but it might be a good idea to have a few chats with the Martians before sending rockets across space for a possible unfriendly reception. Hogben planned to send a simple code through a series of radio messages in the hope that extraterrestrials would receive and decode them, and then send some kind of response. Did extraterrestrials receive these signals? And did we get a response which has resulted in one of the biggest cover-ups in human history? March 4th, 1954. Over three years before the launch of the first man-made satellite Sputnik 1, the Los Angeles Times released an article suggesting that scientists had reason to believe that some small objects may be orbiting the Earth. Clyde Tomba, the discoverer of the planet Pluto, and Dr. Lincoln La Paz, an astronomer from the University of New Mexico and a pioneer in the study of meteors, were assigned to search for the orbiting bodies. Two months later, Major Donald Kehoe, the head of the biggest UFO research organization at the time called the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, announced in an interview that one or two artificial satellites in an unfamiliar retrograde orbit had been detected by Air Force radar at White Sands. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the San Francisco Examiner released stories about the detection. The reports contained a notice from Canadian government scientists asking any skywatchers to be especially alert and called for them to report any unidentified aerial objects that they had seen over the previous two weeks. Aviation Week broke the same story in August 1954. They confirmed Kehoe's claim that there were two large objects orbiting the Earth, one at 400 miles and one at 600 miles above the Earth. They claimed that the objects were natural space rocks or asteroids, but scientists soon rejected the notion that Earth could capture natural objects that would take a retrograde orbit around the planet. In January 1960, the Dark Fence Satellite Surveillance System detected another anomalous object which this time was in polar orbit. The commanding officer of Dark Fence raced to the Pentagon and reported the menacing stranger to the Chief of Naval Operations, and within minutes the news was communicated to President Eisenhower and marked as top secret. Three weeks after its discovery, it was made public and featured on the front page of many newspapers. The article stated that two months before this, Discoverer 8 had been fired into space and was still in orbit. But Navy trackers who keep a watch on all space objects said they knew the exact whereabouts of the Discoverer rocket casings, and that this object was definitely not one of them. At first it was thought that the object had been put there by the Russians. There was also some speculation that it was a stray British rocket from the Black Knight Project. At the time, putting an object into a polar orbit and keeping it there was a feat that neither the British nor the Russians had been able to accomplish. But the object was soon dubbed the Black Knight, after the aforementioned British rocket. It took one whole month until Time magazine released an article offering the official explanation. And even though the Navy had previously stated that they knew the exact whereabouts of the Discoverer satellites and that the only one still orbiting was Discoverer 8, it contradictorily stated the evidence from both Air Force and Navy pointed to Discoverer 5, which was fired from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California in August 1959. In March 1960, a mysterious satellite was investigated by the CIA. The object was observed on March 6th by the crew of a Swedish Airlines plane. The captain's report stated that judging from all the circumstances, it was an unidentified satellite. It was very bright and moving in a northwesterly direction just after 8 p.m. He said without a doubt it was some form of satellite. The same object was also observed from the Stockholm Observatory. An employee said that it seemed to be a satellite and that he was certain it wasn't a meteor. Both sightings were reported in the Swedish newspaper Today's News. The CIA report also talks of a so-called phantom satellite known as 1960 Alpha, which was also observed over Stockholm in Sweden on the same day. It was said to make a 90-degree turn before disappearing below the horizon. Another skywatcher was waiting to observe the phantom satellite at exactly the same time when he saw two objects which looked and moved like satellites make a 180-degree turn. In September 1960, reports of strange retrograde satellites were increasing and were causing quite a stir in the physics and astronomy community. Amateur astronomers from coast to coast and from Michigan to Missouri had reported seeing the objects. 
One object was said to appear at around the same time as the Echo 1 satellite, which was launched on August 12, 1960. Grumman Aircraft Corporation decided to set up a tracking station to capture a photograph of this mystery object. And on August 25, 1960, they were successful. This is the actual photograph taken by Grumman, and it's still the only confirmed photo of one of the mystery satellites available to the public. Grumman also confirmed that the object appeared around the same time as the Echo 1 satellite. They said that the color of the object varied from carrot to straw, and that the object was in a retrograde orbit traveling in an easterly to westerly direction. A few days before, on August 17th, this picture was taken in Bloomfield, Connecticut. It shows the Echo 1 satellite with an unknown object passing it on a strange orbit. In 1966, J. Allen Hynek from the Air Force's Project Blue Book wrote a long letter to Science Magazine in which admitted the existence of unexplained UFO photos and radar tracking and called for an end to the ridicule of reliable witnesses. He said Air Force reports included unexplained UFO photos, radar tracking, and unexplained pictures from Project Moonwatch and satellite tracking cameras. He also wrote about the existence of a photograph of a retrograde satellite taken two years before the Grumman photo. He said that the unidentified object's speed, as calculated at Chicago's Adler Planetarium, was three times that of any Earth-launched satellite. Unfortunately, Project Blue Book was shut down just four years after this, leaving the Air Force a study on the object incomplete. But one case of a retrograde satellite does remain in the Blue Book archives. The report states that an object was spotted in June 1963. The object was in orbit and traveling 1.5 times the speed of a regular satellite rose as to whether they were artificial or natural. John P. Bagby, who worked in the research division of the Hughes Aircraft Company, wrote some articles concerning these odd satellites. In 1966, he wrote an article for the Nature Journal, stating that during the mid-50s, he analyzed evidence of two swarms of such objects in retrograde orbits. He said that the brilliance of the objects to the naked eye caused most persons contacted to doubt that they were natural. He goes on to say that one of the objects had disappeared, and he thinks that it may have been a natural space rock which had decayed in the Earth's atmosphere during January 1966. So did it decay in Earth's atmosphere? Not according to Bagby's follow-up article, in which he states that he was able to optically observe the object in January 1967. He said that scientists had observed some strange radio anomalies, but they could not trace the origin. Bagby later analyzed the data and was able to correlate it with the orbit of the retrograde satellite. He also suggests that the objects have changed orbit. He discusses various possibilities. However, the analysis is inconclusive, and he thinks that further direct observations of the objects are needed to further determine their orbit. In 1981, Bagby clarifies that at least one retrograde satellite is still in orbit and notes that a retrograde satellite had been spotted in orbit as early as 1880 when a group of retrograde bodies were seen orbiting over Germany. This was reported in the Nature Journal at the time. Despite all these observations, scientists remained adamant that the Earth would not be able to capture a natural satellite that would take a retrograde orbit around the planet. So after all of these observations, the question is still not settled. Could it be that these mysterious satellites are actually artificial, but scientists do not want to risk their reputation and say that there are one or more UFOs orbiting the planet? If you want to get an article published in a journal like Nature, you cannot say that Earth is being orbited by UFOs. To to the readers of nature and the general public, a natural satellite sounds more probable. And yet, science does not accept the latter as fact. So what is going on? And is there any evidence of a cover-up? In 1961, computer scientist Jacques Vallée and his team were working at the Paris Observatory tracking satellites. They started tracking unusual objects that were not man-made satellites. The objects were quite elusive, but the team decided that they would pay close attention to the objects, even though they were not on the schedule of normal satellites. One night they were able to get 11 data points for one of the objects. They found that it was in a retrograde orbit and noted that it was very bright and prominent. That same night, the person in charge of the project confiscated the tape, and the next morning he erased it through fear of ridicule. 
These events contributed to Valet's long-standing interest in the UFO phenomenon. In an interview, Valet stated that other observatories had made exactly the same observation and that there was a lot of data that was never published. Adler Planetarium Director Robert L. Johnson and his colleague Frank Judson had been studying a mysterious orbiting object which would intermittently appear. Speaking in a Newsday interview in 1960, they both positively stated that the object was not an artificial satellite or space rock. Judson said the object didn't maintain a regular schedule like other orbiting bodies and that it appeared some nights and some nights it didn't. They also confirmed that when it did appear, it was usually at about the same time as Echo 1, but going in the opposite direction and about twice as fast. The object was orbiting the planet at an incredible speed, and it remained unidentified. But when Judson was asked the inevitable question, he said he doesn't know what the strange object is, but he doesn't believe in UFOs. Finally, in 1954, Captain Howard T. Orville, head of the President's Weather Control Commission at the White House, was questioned on WFBR radio by Lou Corbin, who served in the U.S. Army Intelligence Corps during World War II. He was asked if he knew of any condition under which two objects could enter the Earth's atmosphere and pick up orbiting at 400 and 600 miles out. To which he replied, not that I know of, your doubts are well justified. Mr. Corbin then asked if the two bodies might be space stations. Captain Orville replied, Well, that is an interesting thought. I don't know of any set of circumstances that would account for two natural objects orbiting around the Earth. During a broadcast with the same station three years later, Captain Orville said that he held the same ideas on unknown satellites orbiting the Earth as he had previously expressed. When asked if there was any new information about the unknown satellites, Captain Orville said that it appeared that the military might have kept the matter from publication. From the American people, asked Mr. Corbin. In reply, Captain Orville said he did not wish to call it a deliberate cover-up. He then added, but we didn't hear any more about it, did we? So there we have it, evidence of a cover-up and the answer to why scientists do not accept that the Earth could capture natural satellites in a retrograde or polar orbit. Because whatever these things are, there is an enormous amount of evidence which suggests that they are not natural. They didn't maintain a regular orbit. They appear and disappear and have an odd color. They also change direction and reflect radio signals which is impossible for natural objects. In more recent years, we have multiple UFO reports from astronauts and numerous videos of various space shuttles being tracked by UFOs whilst in orbit, adding to the evidence that the Earth is being visited. Maybe Lancelot Hogan's radio signals did prompt these strange satellites to appear in orbit around the Earth, or maybe they have always been here. The true origins of these mysterious objects may never be known. Black Knight Satellite. It's claimed to be over 13,000 years old. It was discovered in 1954, and it's apparently the reason that we started the space race in the first place. So why has nobody seen it? Well, they claim it's in a polar orbit. And here we see an example of a polar orbit. But even in this type of orbit, somebody would have to be able to see this, guys, at some point in time. So why aren't we? It's because we're not looking for it. We rely on images from NASA and all of these government agencies, such as this video right here that I found. Is it legit video? Is it hoax video? I can't tell you either way, guys. I've seen so much stuff uh, in the last year that it's, just, it's so hard to tell. But when we look at this video right here, we can see the claim of this object being a seat is false. Look at the size. Look at the relationship of size as the shuttle passes over uh, the Black Knight satellite, or what's claimed to be the Black Knight satellite. That's a pretty decent sized object right there, guys. So why is nobody talking about this? Why do we never hear anything about this? Well, we have a lot of people out there that report on it. A lot of people talk about it, but we really don't have facts on it, guys. That's what we need. We need a campaign where we have astronomers out there with telescopes. Uh, 
we need them looking in the skies. We need to find things like this. They're very easy to match up, guys, when we find a satellite through the telescope. We can match that up really easy. We know what should be there. We know what shouldn't be there. We need a very serious observing campaign to try and find this thing. Although it is in polar orbit, it is visible, guys. It will make its way over land, and people will be able to see it. So, where do we go from here? It's simple. We get out there, and we start looking. We stop relying on NASA. We stop relying on the European Space Agency. We stop relying on the Chinese Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency. And we start relying on ourselves. With the technology we have out there that's available to us, guys, we're perfectly capable of making observations such as this and doing searches like this from here on Earth with absolutely no problem. Like I said, it's not hard to match up a satellite in orbit. Um, we got all the specs. We know where they should be. And we know where things shouldn't be. So why aren't we out there doing it? It's because we're getting lazy, guys. We come on YouTube. We go to NASA. We go to JPL. We punch in a couple letters on the keyboard and we get the information that we're looking for or the information that we think that we're looking for. It's always altered and it sucks. And it's never accurate, guys. The only accurate information we're going to get is from ourselves. Now, we see all these videos from NASA. We know about the UFOs that they constantly capture up there. Everybody's on board with this. You know, we all say, oh, yes, yes, NASA captured UFOs. NASA did this, and look at what they have. But then when it comes down to the Black Knight satellite, there's so much denial going on with it. How is it that NASA can capture UFOs on video, and you agree with that during an STS mission? But we give you some video or we give you some high resolution that comes straight from the NASA websites of this object and people go into denial mode. No, it's no, it's fake. Well, here's an image uh, that I put as a comparison from what I think that I've caught around the SOHO satellites. This object bounces around. This is the rumor. One day it's here, another day it's there. We don't know, guys. We really don't know, and that's the whole point. We don't know, but we want to know. Welcome back to UFO Planet. I better try that again. Welcome back to UFO Planet. Now we're going to head right into our interview with Bob Figuera. A few weeks ago, I gave Bob an assignment to do some research on the Black Knight satellite. There was a lot of questions and a lot of requests coming in to have something on the program about that. So Bob went out and he looked for pretty much everything that was out there, read through it, studied it, and then I interviewed, it, interviewed him about it so that he could share that information with the rest of us. So let's get that interview started right now. We're here again with Bob Figuera. Bob is joining us from Brook Trails, California, in the United States of America. And Bob was on special assignment for UFO Planet. He was sent out to find out as much information as he could about the Black Knight satellite that is allegedly orbiting Earth. Welcome to the program again, Bob. Hey, thanks, Darren. That's nice to be here. Well, it's nice to have you. So, Bob, you had a pretty tough assignment on your hands there. There was a lot of information to sift, sift through, I can imagine. So, kind of give me a synopsis of what you found there. Okay. Um, you know, the whole, the whole Black Knight thing is, uh, you know, a mysterious satellite that's been orbiting the moon and the Earth and a bunch of different opinions on, on what it is, where it came from, and how it got here, and why, and all that stuff. And... Um, it's uh, it's gone a lot of different directions. Okay, let, let's just start off here with the basics first. Apparently, there are those who are saying that there is this gigantic satellite that has been labeled the Black Knight satellite that is orbiting the Earth, and some say it's been orbiting the Earth for 13,000 years. Is that correct? 
Yeah, some say thirteen, some say fifteen thousand. It, it all started in uh, eighteen ninety nine with Nikola Tesla, the, okay. you know, technology man of the of, of the century, you know. And, uh, and and I guess he got the first message, but he wasn't able to decipher it or didn't have the technology to really figure out where it came from. Okay. And, so in 1920, a bunch of college ham operators, like a group of ham operators, they, they received the first message. They weren't able to do anything with it either. The technology wasn't there. Okay. It wasn't until, yeah, it wasn't until like uh, 1927 or 28 where they actually got their echo radio transmission technology down where they could actually triangulate a position of an origin of a signal. Okay, and this, they did, that wasn't done by the college students, so that was done by military officials, is that correct? Uh, it, yeah, well, it was uh, it was basically a Norwegian professor of mathematics in the University of Oslo. Oh, okay. And then, and then one other guy, uh, chief consultant uh, from the Naval Operations Center, they all got together with their technology, combined their technology and information. They were able to ascertain the distance that this thing was based on the echo time what delay. What kind of distance did they find it was sitting out at? Now, originally they said it was 20, uh, 6,200 miles, something like that. Okay. It was out there a ways. Okay. Now, also, okay, carry on there. Now, when did the Soviets come into the picture? Well, that would be 1957 where they first launched Sputnik 1. They actually saw this thing in polar orbit with, on the moon, around the moon. Okay. And, uh, and it, it, it was a... <laughs> It was a it was a difficult target. It, they could never rely on it because they didn't understand the nature of its of its orbit. Okay. So they didn't know where to be, where to look for it because it was always changing. Okay. Now uh, then then we move on. So that's the Soviet seeing it with Sputnik. And then we move ahead a little bit, not too much. And apparently, the some sort of a satellite that we had up or the Americans had up at that time was able to capture some of the first photographs of the satellite orbiting yeah. Earth this time. Yeah. Yeah. From what I understand is that uh, the information they got from the Soviets gave them the, the intention for their Discovery 5 mission. Okay. And so they they launched it out from Vandenberg Air Force Base here in California mm -hmm. uh, in 1959. Okay. And uh, and they their intention was to go film this thing. Apparently, Grum, Grumman had some contact. Or, or some technology that was in one of those satellites, the early satellites, and they actually got the first photos of it. Okay. Now, is, is it true that this is kind of what the time in history when kind of the flow of information stopped about the Black Knight satellite? We didn't, we all of a sudden didn't hear a whole lot about it anymore. Is that correct? Well, that was just the real early stages where they were actually just starting to get some real information about it. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, they built it, they had a new program. The Defense uh, Department had a new program called Dark Fence. And it was a, a tripwire uh, radar that went from Alabama to Arizona with these 50... Uh, um, meter wide transmission uh, receivers, whatever. Okay. And so they they actually got two sightings up the first day it was running, and then they'd gotten several more in the in the coming upcoming days. So that's where that real interest started with the with the government. Um, it, and then in like 1960. Uh, you know, the, the commander of that pro project uh, went to the Pentagon and, and talked with some commander there, and they, they all got excited, and they went running to Eisenhower, and they all, you know, labeled it as top secret. Okay, so that's well, where the flow of information comes to a cease then. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> it changed orbit from the moon to Earth okay. in 1960. And they thought it was a new satellite. But apparently, somehow, either their first assumptions were wrong and it was actually been in polar orbit. So the Soviets didn't know this. And they thought it was a new satellite. 
but apparently it had been going around the Earth above them because when their orbit was at 200 miles, this thing was way above them. Right. And they could only see it when it, they could only see it when it was out in front of them because it was always over their head. Okay. Right. So, so that led to some confusion then at the time. Yeah. Well, you know, all this stuff was all brand new to them and stuff. Oh, and, absolutely. Um, so. Um, now, how do we how do we advance up? Sorry, go ahead. It wasn't until like '73 with this this writer. He was a he was an astronomer, a writer, Scottish guy, uh -huh. uh, Duncan Duncan Lunan. Uh, he he was the guy who was able to take this radio signal and decipher it. Okay. And, and and that was pretty interesting because that was the first indication that we had what the what the the intent of this satellite was. And it was it was simply stated it says that our home is Epsilon Booties, which is a double star. We live on the sixth planet of seven, counting outwards from the sun, which is the larger of the two suns. Our sixth planet was one moon. Our fourth planet has three moons. First planet has three <laughs> the first and third planets each have one moon and they say our probe is orbiting your moon interesting yeah and then it gives an update to this constellation okay so it's just so i understand it correctly and the viewers understand it correctly this scientist deciphered the message that was being transmitted by this satellite and that's what he said that's what he speculated that it said I'm not sure how much speculation, how much technology was, you know, created that message. He was a writer. Mm -hmm. so it kind of got. There might have been some uh, Hollywoodization of that. Is that what you're saying, potentially? Possible, but you know, up to that point, there was no speculation as to why this thing was here. I mean, and and it was, it was only in calculating. He had a good enough data where he could calculate the position of the stars in that constellation and determine that that's the way that constellation looked like 13,000 years ago versus the way it looks like today. Oh, very interesting. So that's why he, there, there is the speculation that that's about the time that the satellite was sent. Right. Oh, it all so, so lands together there. Yeah, so now people are wondering, okay, well, if they put it up there 13,000 years ago, why would they do that? And many people have made speculations as to why, and I've read all the reports and stuff, mm -hmm. and the way I see it, there's only three possible explanations, okay. and that is that, you know, the Black Knight was, was put over our planet because they had to leave our planet. And they wanted to leave a, a, a you know historical record of why they were there, why it was left there, and w where they went. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Second. So, yeah, the second would be the development since we understand the time space continu continuum thing, right? Mm -hmm. And and that, yeah, and and that this is just simply a time capsule that was placed there by those off-worlders who actually live on that planet Bootes in the uh, Epsilon constellation. Okay, now, and number three? Uh, well, that would be uh, that there was some new discoveries recently, and now this is on me. Distinguished astronomer Clyde W. Tombaugh, best known for his discovery of the dwarf planet Pluto in 1930, to run a search for the mystery object. The mysterious object later became known as Black Knight. 